Area Community Conversations for April 21st, 2021, sponsored by the Interfaith Leaders Coalition and hosted by English Lutheran Church. I'm moderator Glenn Bickford, interim pastor at English Lutheran Church. Community conversations are intended to be in meaningful, thoughtful discussions of important local topics, often with a faith-based perspective. Our topic today is climate change, current trends, and what we can do about it. Audience questions are following the presentation. If you're watching this live on YouTube, you may post your question on the chat. You'll need a Google or YouTube account to do this. We'll ask your questions of our guest after the presentation. I will share these with our guest speaker, Dr. Casey Meehan. Our recording of today's program will be available at interfaithleaders.org. It's the last of our community conversations for the 2020-2021 season. We will return in the fall. If you have speakers or topics you'd like to hear, contact us at English Lutheran or Pastor Park Hunter at Onalaska UMC. Thank you for coming. Let's open with a prayer by Pastor Park Hunter. So hello. Uh, I am Pastor Park Hunter of uh, Onalaska United Methodist Church, and I am the interim uh, leader of uh, Interfaith Leaders Coalition. And uh, I'm pretty excited to be here today. Uh, most religious traditions emphasize the role of a creator God and, and of humanity's stewardship of creation. And particularly in the Christian and Jewish uh, faiths, our scripture begins with God creating the world and calling it good and then tasking humanity specifically to care for the world. In uh, Genesis 2, it says the Lord God took the human and put him in the garden uh, to work and take care of it. And yet even in these early chapters uh, where everything is good, God places limits on, on the resources that humans can use, saying, for on the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And so as we listen to Dr. Meehan today discuss climate change, and as we prepare to celebrate Earth Day tomorrow, I want to invite you to join me in prayer. Creator God, we give you thanks for the goodness of the earth, its beauty, and its bounty. We enjoy sun and rain in measure, summer and winter and spring and fall. We watch the eagles circle above the ever-flowing river and the trees budding on the bluffs, and we know that we are blessed. We eat of the farmer's crops, the fishermen's catch, and the hunter's success. We build our homes and drive our cars using the resources buried in or growing upon the earth. We must confess that we are sometimes greedy and we abuse the earth's resources. Guide us in caring for the world that you have given us to live in so that we might pass on to our children a garden of paradise indeed. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Park. Now to talk about today's topic, climate change, current trends, and what we can do about it. I'm moderator today because in addition to being an interim pastor, I also have a degree in meteorology from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our speaker today, Dr. Casey Meehan, serves as the Director of Sustainability and Resilience at Western Technical College and as an associate lecturer at the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. He also directs the Sustainability Institute a 501c3 dedicated to celebrating and inspiring sustainability in the Driftless region. Dr. Casey holds a PhD in climate change education from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He currently lives in La Crosse with his wife and two young boys. And now we'll turn it over to Casey. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for um, inviting me to, to speak here. Um, it's, it's really an honor. And uh, as, you, as you know, tomorrow is the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. Um, Earth Day was initially this celebration created by Wisconsin's very own Gaylord Nelson. Um, and, and it was meant to educate people about environmental issues. But it also was designed to, you know, recognizing that we all share in the fate of the story of planet Earth. And today, a major piece of that story is about human-caused climate change. 
so we're going to be discussing what climate change is, uh, how it impacts us right here in, in La Crosse, what we can do about it, and then some current trends that we're seeing happening right now. This is very, very much our story collectively, but it's also very much your story. Um, all of us are deeply connected to what's going on with climate change. Um, and you're likely already doing some things that we need to do to address the problem. So that's great. Um, to start though, let's, uh, we, we need to give the story a little bit of context. So we need to talk about the big picture regarding what's been happening in the last 60, 70 years or so. Some people are calling this what's the, the great acceleration. So since around 1950, uh, there's been some key metrics that have really accelerated at an incredible rate. Uh, you know, we've got double the population now. Our economy is over five times larger and the associate, associated demands on food um, and water and, and fossil fuels, um, those have all increased. And at the same time, the amount of energy that we've used over the last 60 or 70 years has just skyrocketed. Um, we've also been, been losing tropical forests at an increasing rate. And all of this, well, we've been pouring more and more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So in fact, this spring, scientists in Hawaii actually recorded 420 parts per million of CO2, carbon dioxide, in the atmosphere. That's the highest level we've seen since records have been kept. And it's the highest that it's been in at least 800,000 years. So this is really all climate change is about. It's, it's simple, really. Our actions have thrown this really delicate balance of Earth's systems out of whack. And the imbalance causes impacts that ripple outward. We feel them in, in lots of different ways. So I know lots of you are already familiar with the science of climate change, but I'm going to touch on it just a little bit, just the basics. And scientists have actually understood the basics of climate change since the middle of the 1800s. So this is nothing new. Um, just despite what it seems like to us just mere humans when we're standing on the, on the ground and looking up at this, you know, what seems like an infinite sky, um, the sky actually is not a vast and limitless expanse. Um, in reality, there's just this little, this thin shell of atmosphere that's surrounding our planet. So here's how climate change works. Energy from the sun comes to earth in the form of light and it passes right through that atmosphere. And then after the earth absorbs most of this energy, some of it in the form of heat energy uh, and, and infrared radiation is radiated back out into space. But you know, because of the natural layer of greenhouse gases that we have, some of that heat is trapped within the atmosphere. And that's a really good thing um, because that's what has kept our temperatures here on earth within tolerable boundaries so that we can, we can thrive and all life on, on the planet can thrive. But here's the problem. We are thickening the natural greenhouse layer. Um, and so as it gets thicker, more of that infrared energy gets trapped. And that's global warming. That's, that's the climate crisis that we're in. Um, as more of that carbon dioxide gets trapped, the atmosphere, um, the atmosphere as a whole gets warmer. And we can see that warming in the temperature record. Um, I love this image. This is an image that was created by a climate um, scientist in the UK, his name is Ed Hawkins. And uh, each stripe on this, on this um, image here represents a single year from 1850 to 2019. 1850 being on the, on the left side of your screen, 2019 being on the right side of your screen. And they're colored, each stripe is colored based on how far above or below that year's average temperature differed from the 1970 to 2000 global average with red being warmer and darker red being a lot warmer and blues in the, in the deeper blues being, being colder. In fact, 19 of the 20 hottest years ever measured with instruments have been since 2000 and seven of the hottest of all have been the last seven years. So we can also look at decades, right? And, and look at the pattern in decades, the warmest decade um, that we've had after, you know, since measuring, since measuring this stuff was the 2010s. And before that, it was the 2000s. Previous to that, it was the 1990s. 
and the pattern just keeps going. Um, so currently, we are about 2.1 degrees Fahrenheit above the pre-industrial global average. Um, and climate science suggests that we need to stay below about 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.5 Celsius is the number that gets thrown out a lot. 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, we need to stay below that to avoid some of the greatest risks of, of large scale disruptions because of climate change. The current emission trends right now have us somewhere around three degrees Fahrenheit higher by the middle of this century. So we've got some work to do. So what does this mean actually for Wisconsin and particularly for, for our area in, in the drift list? Um, Earth Day in La Crosse is now actually three degrees Fahrenheit warmer on average than it was on the first Earth Day 51, 51 years ago. The warming that we see here is actually um, a little bit more pronounced in the winter time. Um, it's about five degrees warmer now in the winter than it was in the 1970s. And what, what we're seeing is a, is a sort of a shrinking, less intense winter, um, and it's pushing our shoulder seasons a little bit. So our spring, the, the buds happen, um, you know, trees bud out a little bit earlier now. And in the fall, uh, we get our first frost a little bit later. And you might say that's great, right? Earlier spring, that's wonderful. I get sick of the winter times. Um, earlier spring, actually, if we think about this in a bigger system, the earlier spring actually is disrupting the food supply for migrating birds that come through this area. It's increasing the potential for crop damage. It's increasing our pollen season. So if you suffer from seasonal allergies like I do, things get a little bit more miserable earlier. Um, and, and it also in earlier spring causes insects um, to mistime the pollination. Again, this, this damages the crops. A warmer atmosphere is also able to hold more moisture. So in addition to warmer temperatures, we're also experiencing a wetter driftless area with more extreme downpour events. So heavy downpour events in the upper Midwest have actually uh, increased about 42% since the middle of last century. What you see on the, on the screen now is a, uh, um, a record of mega rain events um, in Minnesota. So a mega rain event is one that drops at least six inches of rain over an area of a thousand square miles or more. So these are these massive storms that are just dropping all sorts of rain. And what you can see is the frequency of, of mega rain events just exploding in the last 20 years. The first hundred years of records had just five events. The next 33 years had another five events. But the last 20 years, we've seen 11 mega rain events happening. And again, that's because a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. It's got more energy. And if you live almost anywhere in Wisconsin, you're familiar with the results, right, of, of a mega rain event. Um, here's Lafarge, Wisconsin in August of 2018. Um, that's when, uh, during that August, uh, Lafarge and, and southwestern Wisconsin had six months worth of rain, about 20 inches fell in just 15 days. We can look even now a little bit longer term. What do these changes look like for us in the driftless area longer term? Well, under the current rate of emissions um, of, of greenhouse gas emissions that we're putting up right now, by 2080, the summers in La Crosse are expected to feel a lot like the present day summers in Lansing, Kansas, um, which is nearly seven degrees warmer and about 10% wetter. So that's under our current emissions scenarios by the you know, middle to end of, of this century. That's sort of where we're heading climate wise. 2020 um, was a banner year in, in many respects when it comes to climate change. And in many ways, not a good way. Um, if I had to choose just one image uh, that, that encapsulates the year of, of climate change, it would be this one. Um, this is a picture of Hurricane Epsilon in the Atlantic Ocean, churning, churning in the Atlantic Ocean in October of 2020. Um, now the Hurricane Epsilon, they had to use that because they ran out of names um, and had to use the Greek alphabet for, for naming because there's just too many storms. They ran out of names on the list. There's 30 named storms last year. Um, so 2020 broke all sorts of records, one, one of them being the, the number of named storms that we had. But what I think is really fascinating about this picture is if you look carefully at the top and sort of upper right-hand corner, um, you can see a brownish cloud. That brownish cloud is the smoke from wildfires in Colorado. 
Um, so here we have the 30th named, or, or, or uh, one of the last named storms of, the, of a, of a record-breaking year with storms and wildfire smoke, all in one picture. Um, the extent of wildfires around the world in 2020, um, to me, was one of the biggest climate stories, if not the biggest climate story. And it's also one that we would expect because of the direct and indirect impacts of climate change. So here's Australia at the end of December in 2019. Um, well, fires have historically um, occurred primarily in places that uh, where few people lived in Australia. Uh, last year's Australian fires were a little bit different because they affected populated areas. Um, in New South Wales and in Victoria alone, there's about 16 million acres burned. Um, well, millions more burned in, in uh, other parts of the country. Here's an image from a European satellite last summer showing um, fires in Siberia, in, in the Russian Arctic. I mean, we have the Arctic burning, right? That's, that's, that's pretty momentous. And of course, there were the fires um, throughout the West, um, the Western US. Today, the fire season um, it, out West is about 100 days or so longer than it was in the 1970s. This is the Hennessy fire. Um, part of a complex of fires, which were all caused by the impact of Tropical Storm Fausto, um, which fueled a thunderstorm uh, in uh, along California that was moving through the area um, during a heat wave. In 2020, California experienced five of the six largest fires in their state's modern history. Um, of course, it caused billions of dollars, um, over 30 people were killed. And the last reports that I've read are that California is actually falling deeper in drought. So this fire season has potential to be um, just as devastating. And it's, it's, you know, these ripple effects that we see from a warming atmosphere, it's more than just hurricanes and fires. Um, climate change is impacting our agriculture. So even though warmer temperatures could benefit crop productivity uh, by providing a longer growing season, extreme heat conditions are stressful to both crops and to livestock. And then in addition to that, that extra rain that we're getting uh, that actually makes it harder to plant and, and harder to harvest. And it promotes plant pests and diseases and invasive species. Climate change is impacting our water supplies throughout the world. Um, here's Lake Mead, um, which is along the Colorado River, uh, right at the Nevada-Arizona border. And it, uh, the Colorado River, millions of people depend on that out west um, and in Mexico for water. Um, now, in, in 2016, it was reaching some pretty, pretty low levels, um, as you can see the, the markings on the rocks there, where the water should be at or, or, or was at previously. Now, it has bounced back a bit since this picture was taken in 2016, but it's actually on its way back down again. Um, officials are, just came out with warnings last week that they'll likely be declaring a water shortage by this fall. So we're seeing those water levels go back down. Climate change impacts our infrastructure, which you know, here in the Driftless area, we, we've experienced that firsthand, right? Um, again, here's, here's a, a picture from the, those, those rains that we had in August of 2018. Um, flooding from rainstorms during that storm, that, that system of storms alone cost West, Western and Southern Wisconsin about $69 million in infrastructure damage to our roads and bridges. Climate change is contributing to um, arguably the, the worst extinction event since the extinction of the dinosaurs um, 65 million years ago. So aside from the fact that, that all of these species have an inherent right to live, um, mass extinction is dangerous to, to our own well-being as humans. Um, you know, all species on earth contain this blueprint for life that, that we can use to help inform us how to live better on a planet. Um, and moreover, nature really provides um, you know, all sorts of services for us. They're called ecosystem services, of which we don't pay, by the way. Um, you know, services like cleaning the pollution, um, pollinating plants that feed us, helping maintain uh, balance within our ecosystem. Uh, climate change is, is uh, uh, affecting the migration patterns of people around the world. Um, there's a growing classification of people that we now call climate refugees who are moving because the part of the world that they live in is no longer conducive to their ability to live. Um, you know, many of the caravans that we're seeing moving from Central America um, up to the, to the US border are actually at their root climate related. Um, and anecdotally, we're, we're hearing about people in the US moving 
in California due to water and fire conditions, right? Moving from Louisiana and the coast of the Gulf because of sea level rise. So this idea of climate migrants um, and climate refugees is, is only going to, um, to get worse. Climate change, um, you know, because of climate change, we're seeing the spread of disease vectors like uh, mosquitoes and, and ticks. So, you know, there's a picture of a deer tick um, and many of us are familiar with the growing incidence of Lyme disease um, here in the upper Midwest, which is, which is uh, carried by, by deer ticks. Um, you know, we're also seeing some, some, some other tick related diseases, uh, anaplasmosis and in Minnesota, um, not too long ago, they, they started seeing Powassan, which is another tick, tick related disease. Climate change impacts the way we play. Um, this is a, a shot of a dog sled race in Northern Wisconsin. Um, of course, there isn't any snow, right? It's hard to have a dog sled race when, when you don't have much snow or not consistent snow. Uh, so what some races have been doing is, is taken to using these modified carts that you see in the picture, kind of like a, a three wheel bike instead of sleds. Um, in fact, about a third of dog sled races in Wisconsin um, typically get canceled because of, due, because of a lack of snow. And then, of course, uh, climate change is impacting our very health um, as, as humans on this earth. If we keep going at this rate, if we can't figure out how to rebalance this system, climate change is going to be a massive disruption to everything on this planet. And this is particularly true for the most vulnerable populations among us, low-income communities, Black and Indigenous communities, the elderly, the very young. These are people that are disproportionately impacted by climate change already. And you know, this also puts future generations at risk. Um, and, and they didn't have anything to do with this, right? So, so this climate change could, could really be a mess for centuries or, or even thousands of years to come. So where exactly does this leave us? Um, you, know, you may have heard these reports saying like, you know, we've got 10 years left. Um, to do something. We only have until 2030 to, to change um, the planet or it's going to be destroyed. Do we really only have, you know, nine or 10 years left? Is that, is that true? Uh, well, the longer we wait, it, it is true that the longer we wait, the more difficult and costly and harmful the problem becomes for all of us all over the world um, and for future generations. But, but the bottom line is that the future hasn't been written yet. We have all the tools and all the technology and know-how that we need to write a very different future right now. We just need to make the decision to do that. Um, so how, how do we do that? How do we keep moving forward, right? What is the plan here? I would argue that a pretty good place to start is with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And, and actually in my work at Western Technical College and then with the Sustainability Institute, we base a lot of our sustainability work off of these goals. So these are 17 integrated goals that have been rolled out by the UN in, in 2015. Sometimes they're called the global goals. And these goals are meant to address some of today's most pressing problems, including abject poverty, um, inequity, destruction of habitat and biodiversity, and, and of course, climate change. And I'll be the first to say that they're not perfect, right? But it's the best plan we have so far to improve life now and, and moving forward into the future. So the, these 17 goals collectively, uh, they have, they've got some goals that are meant to ensure basic, basic services to people. So food, right? Healthcare, clean water, um, access to, to electricity to power their lives. There are some goals that are meant to bring about equity um, and eliminate poverty. Some of these goals are meant to promote pro prosperity and innovation within our societies. And all of this happens within a framework of stewarding our environment and promoting peace and transparent decision-making. So like I said, these goals collectively are integrated, meaning that work done mindfully in any one of these can help advance work done in any of the other ones. And indeed, you know, all of these need to get done if we want to live in a healthy, uh, on a healthy planet in, in a healthy society. So let's think about climate then. What is it going to take, considering these sustainable development goals, what is it actually going to take 
to get climate change under control. Well, we can fix this in, in uh, we sort of have three ways of, of, of fixing this problem. Job number one would be to reduce our emissions from fossil fuels to zero. So remember, this is a balance issue, right? The way that we produce electricity and move around and grow our food and use our land, what you see basically on the left side of this chart here, um, the way that we do those things now contributes carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so what we need to do, job number one, is to make the bars on the left there um, going into the atmosphere much skinnier or better yet non-existent. And we do that, we, we reduce our emissions in, in a couple of different ways. First of all, we do that by transitioning to renewable energy sources um, so that we can produce the electricity that we need to live without producing greenhouse gases. Um, this gets at UN Sustainable Development Goal number seven. Did you know enough sun falls on our planet uh, in one hour to power all of human activity for a year? And wind energy is also treme a tremendous source of renewable energy. And both of those are readily available in many places of the world, including right here in the upper Midwest. Another thing to do to reduce emissions is to think about sustainable development goal number 12, which is about responsible consumption and production. So if everyone on earth lived the way that we live on average in the US and in Canada, in terms of how much we consume, um, we need about five earths to support us. Um, that, that's, that's amazing, right? We use a lot of resources and a lot of energy intensive resources. So we need to rethink about, um, re rethink how we manufacture and consume and dispose of our stuff in, to, to be way less energy um, intensive. Also going along with that sustainable development goal number 12, we need to be smarter about how we produce and transport and consume our food. Um, you know, the, the driftless region has been a leader in progressive farming since, um, you know, at least the 1930s. It's really, it's really cool. It's a beacon, you know, for the world in many ways. Our farmers in this area are just rock stars. Um, but that isn't the case in, in much of the world. We need to improve agricultural practices to be less energy intensive. We also need to think, if, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not a farmer, um, we, we can also be rethinking about what we do with our food once it's grown. Um, because uh, you know, we, we waste a, a lot of our food. It either it doesn't make it to market or we throw it out. And the food that we throw out actually produces a really significant amount of greenhouse gases in the landfill. So we need to be smarter about, about the way that we're using our food. Um, by 2050, over two thirds of people around the globe are gonna be living in cities. So we need to reimagine them to be more efficient and emit fewer greenhouse gases. And we can do that by um, helping people move around in, in um, you know, around cities using multiple forms of transportation that aren't, uh, that aren't burning fossil fuels. We can do that by uh, retrofitting and uh, old buildings and businesses and building new businesses and building buildings and businesses that are just much more efficient with energy. Um, all of this gets its sustainable development goal number 11. So that's job number one, right? We need to reduce our emissions going into the atmosphere. Job number two occurs on the right side of this, of this diagram. Um, and that's, uh, the, the land, you know, the, our land and our oceans actually absorb some of the carbon that we put into the atmosphere. And so th these are known as sinks. Um, but our current practices are diminishing nature's ability to do that, to take up that carbon. So job number two is about supporting Earth's natural ability to soak up carbon. Our oceans absorb about 20% of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So we can support healthy ocean and coastal features like mangroves and seagrasses and kelp forests. Um, you know, that can remove carbon, but it can also provide us with food and fuel and fertilizer. This is all sustainable development goal number uh, 14. Forests, particularly our tropical rainforests, uh, are, are like the lungs of the planet. You might've heard that expression before, right? The, the, the Amazon rainforest is the lungs of our planet. Um, 
it's because it takes up massive amounts of CO2. Um, and we need to eliminate deforestation um, and instead pursue reforestation. Like oceans, our forests you know, provide us with sources of food, um, medicine, and habitat for millions of species of animals who we share the, plan the planet with. So this is sustainable development goal number 15 in action. And I mentioned that there were, th there were three jobs. So one deals with keeping carbon pollution out of the atmosphere. The second one deals with supporting our earth systems to, to pull that carbon out. The third one is actually about improving society via all the other sustainable development goals. Doing things like bringing about equality, eradicating poverty and hunger, uh, fostering health and well-being, providing a decent quality education for everyone, um, you know, insisting on open and democratic governments. Uh, these things often have really big secondary benefits for climate change. Plus they're just things we, we need to be doing anyway. So the three jobs we really need to accomplish to get back into balance, touch on many of those sustainable development goals. And here's the cool thing, in my work and in the conversations that I have with people, I have yet to meet someone who isn't passionate and likely working towards at least one of those global goals. And remember, by working towards one of, the, one of them, any one of them, you're actually either doing job number one, you're reducing carbon emissions, right? or you're doing, working on job number two, you're supporting the earth's natural systems, or you're working on job number three, improving society so that everybody can thrive. So again, you are already part of this story and, and you're very likely part of the solution already. So let's quickly review here. Climate change is simple, right? It's all about rebalancing. It's serious. Uh, the, the quality of life of billions um, now and in the future is, is, is on the line. Um, but it's also eminently solvable. We know what we need to do to solve it. And we have all the technology we need to make huge inroads on the climate, the climate crisis right now. And I'm actually really hopeful that we're starting to get on the right path. Um, you know, the events of the past few years and especially the events of 2020 have helped us reach this inflection point. In fact, um, before we, we went live here, I was talking to, to Pastor Glenn a, a little bit about this. I was slated to, to do this talk last, um, last April and then the pandemic happened and everything sort of got shut down. It's actually a, a kind of a different talk um, this year than it was last year because, of, because I think we've hit this inflection point. You know, between COVID and the storms and fires and a deep freeze in Texas, you know, it's become really difficult for a reasonable person uh, to claim that, that we're not out of balance and that people aren't getting hurt. Um, and here's, here's the great thing, right, is we're seeing changes in people's willingness to take action. You know, some actions that were unthinkable just five years ago are now people are, are actually considering doing. So first, we can look at, at governments sort of around the world. Um, they're starting to really take some action. Uh, one of the first things in 2017 that the previous administration did was remove um, the U.S. from the Paris Climate Accord. The Paris Climate Accord, um, it, it's, was, it's a worldwide agreement signed in 2015 to reduce greenhouse gases in order to limit the average rise in, in the temperature of the earth to no higher than 1.5 degrees um, centigrade. That's 2.7 Fahrenheit. Now, fortunately, the way that that accord was written, um, a withdrawal couldn't actually take effect until four years later, until January of 2021. So one of the first steps the Biden administration took was to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. Um, and that, that's a good thing. Rejoining puts us back at the table to help lead, um, which you know that, that's really important given that we are one of the two largest polluters in the world. So, how is the Paris Accord doing? Like, wh where actually are we at with that? Um, and it's, uh, this is sort of a good reminder that we've got a lot of work left to do, right? So here is the goal, right, for, for the Paris Climate Accord, 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what we wanna keep the global temperature beneath. So 1.5 Celsius or 2.7 Fahrenheit. Uh, and here is where we are at right now at the beginning of 2021. 
We're about 2.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Now our current emissions pathway puts us here by 2100. Um, so by the end of the century, we will be under current policies about 5.2 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Um, and based on what we have so far in pledges and targets from the Paris Accord from countries all over the world, here's where we're at. So you can see the gap of, of the actual pledges and targets and where we need to be. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty substantial gap. So if you're feeling anxious and angry and frustrated, um, you're not alone. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a daunting task, right? Um, we've got a lot of work to do and we've got a lot of work to do quickly. Now, the next um, round of discussions around the, um, the, the Paris Agreement and the pledges and the targets that people make um, is coming up. It's, the, it's called the Conference of Parties and it's coming up in Glasgow, Scotland at the end of this year. And we expect countries are um, actually gonna be bringing much more ambitious goals to the table now that they see where we're actually at. Um, and, and actually we're starting to see those pledges and, and, and things starting to um, at least get formulated. And we'll talk about that in just a sec. So seeing this gap, um, you know, there, there's, been, there's, there's been some more action uh, among our government. Um, in April, 2021, um, President Biden proposed the $2 trillion American Jobs Plan, which was really designed to tackle infrastructure issues, but through a lens of climate change. Um, so, you know, part of this plan includes hundreds of billions, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars to spur on growth of electric vehicles, um, to grow clean energy jobs, to retrofit homes to be more efficient. And this week is actually Climate Action Week in the U.S., um, where uh, Actually, tomorrow and Friday, um, President Biden is convening some leaders from around the world uh, to really set new pledges for, for Paris, for, their, for, their, uh, for the Conference of Parties in Glasgow for, for their Paris Agreement. Um, that's actually being hosted by Biden starting, uh, and, and I believe he's gonna be rolling out some new uh, targets starting tomorrow. So sort of looking forward to, uh, to seeing what those look like. At the state level, um, Governor Evers in, here in Wisconsin established in, I believe it was 2019, the Wisconsin Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy. Um, and he charged that office with creating a clean energy plan to have the state use 100% carbon-free electricity by 2050. Um, cities, cities have also taken up the charge. Um, cities around the world are, are making their own pledges in accordance with, with the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, in fact, over 10,000 cities representing over 1 billion people um, are committed to, uh, to net zero, including right here in La Crosse. Um, our, our former mayor, Mayor Cabot, um, uh, came up with a, or committed the city to carbon neutrality by, by 2050. Climate action, as we know, though, isn't just about what governments do, right? This is a collective effort. So um, I think one of the, one of the, big movements that I've seen lately in the last couple of, for sure the last year, but maybe a couple of two or three years, um, is that we're seeing corporations really commit to reducing emissions. So there's corporations are starting to take this very seriously. Um, here's all, you know, all these automobile, automobile manufacturers around the world are now offering um, or preparing to offer electric cars. Uh, GM, as you, as you know, announced it will only offer electric vehicles by 2035. Uh, there's 310 corporations, including major tech, retail, and food brands that recently formed what's called the We Mean Business Coalition. And they're calling on the Biden administration to commit to cutting U.S. greenhouse gas pollution to at least half of 2005 levels by 2030. Major utilities across the state are committing to net zero carbon emissions. So Excel, which uh, provides a lot of the energy for, for us in Western Wisconsin, pledged 80% reduction in carbon um, in, their, in their emissions by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Uh, four of Wisconsin's seven remaining coal-fired power plants are scheduled to be retired in the next four years, including the, what you see here. This is the Columbia Energy Center in Portage or right outside of Portage. Um, it's the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases in terms of Wisconsin's power plants. Companies like Organic Valley, um, shown here, and Go Macro and Viola, um, they've erected community solar and wind projects that have benefited tens of thousands of rural Wisconsinites. 
So while Wisconsin still lags behind Iowa and Minnesota and Illinois um, in our solar and wind production, there's a lot of opportunity here. We're seeing marches and demonstrations and demands at the ballot box uh, to, for the changes necessary to, to solve this crisis. And a lot of them, this is the coolest thing, a lot of them are led by youth. Um, that's so neat to see younger generations out getting involved with this. And of course, you know, how can we talk about anything um, in 2020 without recognizing the world changing event of COVID? Um, and though they came at way too high of a cost in human life, we did learn a few things. Um, COVID demonstrated just how interconnected our planet is and how out of balance it is. Um, COVID also showed us that people can change behaviors literally overnight. And when we do, the planet can start to bounce back. Um, you know, we saw a 7% decrease in global emissions in 2020. Now they're starting to go back up, but uh, that lockdown really showed that, that these emissions can go down. It's the largest decrease we've seen since, since records have been kept. Um, here's a picture of New Delhi, India in 2019. Here's that same angle uh, about a month after the lockdown in 2020. So we can see this and, and, and we've seen pictures of, you know, LA, the, the skies in, in LA clearing and water in Venice clearing up. And I mean, just all these, these ways that nature is bouncing back fairly quickly. And finally, many people have taken time to just slow down and reprioritize and gain some perspective again. Um, and a big piece of this was connecting back to nature. So our state and national parks saw renewed interest, um, which is great. Uh, you know, we know that people are much more likely to protect nature when they have a connection to it, when they fall in love with nature. So it was good to see people getting back outside. Climate change, like I said, this is, this is not just a story for scientists and for experts to, to take action on. Um, this is a crisis that's impacting the way that you live and the way that you work and the, how you play. And it's going to continue to do that in the, in the coming decades. Um, what you do matters, you know, you, this is, this is your story. You're, you're part of this story. And again, your story is part of our story. Um, climate change is happening now, it's happening all over, including in, in, in La Crosse. And is it serious? Yeah, you bet it is. Um, but remember, we already know how to solve this. Um, listen, if, the, if there's one thing to take away, it's this, despite all the gloom and doom, that comes with climate change, the future isn't written. So as we come out of this year long pause, we have a real choice to make um, about what we want the next chapter to look like. Do we want it to go back to this unbalanced world built on extraction and inequality? Or will we choose a different path for our kids and their, grand and, and their kids and, and their grandkids and, and so on? that's more balanced and regenerative. So we have this incredible chance to reimagine and build a world that provides the opportunity for everybody to thrive. So let's start writing that opportunity into existence. So thank you so much. I'd be happy to, to entertain questions and, uh, and let me also be the first one to, to uh, say a happy Earth Day uh, a little bit early to everyone. Very good. I have some questions already. One, the first one is actually a comment. Um, sure. From Carrie says, we're happy to see this event. So right now as part of the virtual 2020 Earth Fair. And they, they you ask, you were asked to uh, share the link to that calendar they have. And she's already posted in chat. I can also have it posted on the, um, English Lutheran website. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so, yep. So right now the uh, lacrosse La Earth Fair is going on right now. It's a virtual event, um, but we've got some, some wonderful events going on. So I would encourage everyone, uh, anyone who's interested to, to um, head over to that link and check it out. Okay. From the Integral Ecology Director, uh, can you talk more about impacts of flooding in future and the uh, lacrosse area north side residents? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, what I can say I, is that we know this, this, um, these rain events are, are increasing, right? So we're getting more and more of, of these rain events. So we can expect the flooding that we saw in 2017 and 2018 
um, those are going to be more of, of the norm, um, unfortunately. And uh, it, regarding the, the north side of La Crosse, I know that there are um, many of the homes, the, the, the residences in the north side of La Crosse are it, within the floodplain. And so uh, when we, again, talk about infrastructure and talk about, um, you know, what does this mean uh, for our economy? Well, part of it is that um, many more of these homeowners are going to be um, experiencing, unfortunately, the more flooding. Um, and when we also look at, uh, you know, just demographically, this also gets at who is our most, um, um, who are, who are the, the, the populations that are most vulnerable. Um, typically, they, they tend to be, um, again, uh, neighborhoods that are, that are lower income. Um, and that's what we see, again, in, in the, the north side of the cross. If we look at the houses in the floodplain, they're typically in the neighborhoods that, um, that, are, that are typically more marginalized. So it's where, again, we're seeing climate change is dispropor disproportionately impacting um, um, folks that, that are already vulnerable. Hey, thank you. Uh, from Pastor Park. He says the driftless area is home to unique microclimates, including some areas that preserve ice age plants and others that are warm enough for rattlesnakes. How is climate change affecting these areas? Oh gosh, I am not a biologist. Um, so I'm not, I, I can't give specifics here, but again, if we just look at the trends, um, you know, I know that some of these microclimates are extremely sensitive to temperatures. And so as we see um, our winters not be quite as intense and our summers get warmer and those, those shoulder seasons sort of scoot, you know, scooch um, out a little bit, uh, I, I can't imagine that it's going to be healthy for those microclimes. Um, but, but I can't tell you exactly how they're going to be impacted. Okay, thank you. Um, as to remind folks to post questions in YouTube chat, We've got a few questions already, but we can, we have some time for some more. A question from Catherine. Early in the pandemic, we saw photos of lowering smog levels and mountains being visible for the first time. Do you think these images changed people's thinking about our effect on global climate change? Oh, Catherine, that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't I don't have any data to say that it did, but I would I would hope that it did. Um, I you know I I think that there's probably um, you're asking probably some, some good questions that are gonna be the topics of several PhD dissertations in the years to come. Um, but I can imagine, I mean, they're pretty stunning pictures, right? If you've seen like the, the picture I showed of India, right? We've seen that same thing in LA and in China, uh, in Beijing, right? We've seen some pictures that, that are really um, show just remarkable differences. Same thing with water quality in Venice. Um, you know, people were saying that they were seeing fish in the canals in Venice for the first time in years because it wasn't being churned up by, by boat traffic. So I would imagine that this, um, that these pictures would have an impact. I, I mean, I, just for my, for myself, they absolutely had an impact. Right. And, and I'm not unusual. I don't think like, I think lots of people would, would take heart in some of those pictures. Um, I mean, it, it's also, you know, we also have to sort of be careful because some of those pictures, not that they're doctored, but there's lots of different factors that play into what, you know, how much smog is sitting over a city at any one point. Um, lots of weather factors that, that are playing in that. So it's not just how much are we emitting into the atmosphere. There's, there's other things that play there. So those pictures can be a little bit deceiving, but on the whole, I think they're a really, um, again, like I said, sort of a hopeful sign that, that things can bounce back if we just give the planet a chance to do so. Okay, a uh, question from Wesley uh, along the similar lines. What have you seen as the best motivator for reducing factors of human created climate change? Hmm. The best factor, um, so, or the best motivator. I, you know, I really think that it's connections, right? Connecting with people and, and telling stories. Um, we, are a, we are a species that, that um, to communicate to be a story and all of us have a story to tell and all of us probably have a climate story to tell right i mean we, we there, there are places that in the world that all of us have fallen in love with um and when we can have honest conversations with people about those places and and ask them how do they see changes happening in those places that they love 
Um, I think that's when we break down some of these walls and we can motivate people. Um, you know, there's, there's a pretty good body of research out there that, that shows that we are much more likely to protect places and, and take environmental actions when we, um, when we are connected to nature and we connect to nature by experiencing it, right? So the more that we fall in love with a place, the more likely it is that we are going to be, take actions to protect that place. Um, and so as far as, a, you know, the biggest motivating factor, I guess I'm, I'm sort of talking myself into two then, I, you know, one is helping people connect to a place, but two is, is really listening to their stories, right? And having them, um, having those open discussions about what changes they're seeing. Um, and once people see those changes, they're pretty interested in, in figuring out what they can do to, to, um, to help the place thrive, right? Rather than degenerate. Okay. Another question from Wesley, this one more of a theological one. He says, do the seven deadly sins and seven virtues add anything to scientific descriptions and analysis of climate imbalance. Wow, I am not a theologian, so I am not going to go there. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. It's Wesley, that's a great question. I would encourage Pastor Glenn or Pastor Park, if, if you've got uh, insight into that, go for it. Well, I mean, one could argue pride and uh, um, laziness. Some of those things definitely have a factor. The uh, Reluctance to change our behavior as kind of inherent in selfishness, but that's a whole different area of uh, dealing with climate change. It's uh, an interesting area. That's more uh, social psychology. Um, I've got a question from Joyce. How do we sustain interest in changing the thinking to be continually sustainable and to pursue sustainable goals? Could you sure? Could you repeat that question one more time? How do we sustain interest in changing the thinking uh, to be continually sustainable and pursue sustainable goals? Yeah. Um, so this is this is something that I've, I think about a lot. Um, so, you know, I communicate about climate change pretty regularly um, for my job. And I've been thinking a lot about climate change since I've done research, you know, back to my to, um, to my graduate school, you know, 10, 12 years ago now. Um, and one of the things that keeps coming up when we talk about climate change um, and sustainability in general is this, we tend to follow this doom and gloom narrative, right? That's, that's sort of the default that we, that we move into this, um, everything's just going downhill and it's, um, it, it's gonna be terrible. And you know, we see all these apocalyptic movies out there about climate change and, um, and there, don't get me wrong, like there's, there's some truth there in the sense that um, this is a this is a serious problem that we need to get a hold of, and and um, you know we're heading we're heading down a path we probably don't want to be going down right now, but but as far as I know, there's not a robust body of literature out there in the communications field that says that scaring the pants off of people actually motivates them. Um, in, in many cases, it, it what it does is actually causes them to run and hide, right? To stick our head in the sand. Um, there, there's some really cool stuff around what's called the finite pool of worry. And so what that uh, hypothesis says is that people have a finite pool of worry that they're, that they're able to sort of comprehend in their head. And once you hit that, once that pool of worry is full, other worries just, you, you, you sort of go emotionally numb and you just can't deal with them. And usually the, the pool of worries that's, that's in our head is, deals with much more sort of mundane things that are happening in our lives right now. Um, you know, we're worried maybe about what we're going to make for dinner or if we're going to eat dinner or, you know, am I going to have a job? Um, you know, things like that, things that are happening immediately right now, not so much about climate change. So when people get piled on with doom and gloom about climate change, it's sort of one more thing where they just sort of throw their hands up, right? Um, so what I've been thinking and, and, and um, sort of writing about and speaking on lately is this idea of incorporating a, a, a joyful climate work, right? So how do we make climate work more joyful, um, because I, I think this doom and gloom, um, it turns people away. It, it doesn't necessarily engage people. When, when I engage people with doom and gloom, they don't want to come back for more. Like who wants to do that, right? But if we, can, if we can flip the script a little bit and make this about joyful things and opportunity and 
gosh, imagine what a sustainable world would look like. You know, we would have, it's not a scarce world, it's an abundant world, abundance of fresh food, an abundance of clean water, an abundance of ways of moving around a town, right? An abundance of healthcare, an abundance of education. That's really exciting. People wanna get involved in that, right? And so if we talk about wanting to help sustain people in, in doing these goals, I think what we want to do is flip the script a little bit and, and instead help people imagine what a, what a sustainable society would actually look like. What would it feel like? And now all of a sudden, this is, starts to become joyful, right? And it becomes doing sustainable work becomes something that's renewing. It's not depleting. It's, it's actually renewing our spirit. Um, and so I think that's, that's sort of my take on like how we get people to do this stuff and, and keep re-engaging, right? Because you want to re-engage in the stuff that, that's fun, right? And, and it makes you feel really good. So, so let's talk about climate change and let's talk about sustainability with that lens rather than the doom and gloom lens. Thank you, thought provoking. Um, question from Kathy, uh, comment. She's saying, please talk about pushing leaders to make bigger changes more quickly. Example, solar on public buildings, moving people to public transportation, no more subsidies for private vehicles, et cetera. Yeah, that's a, um, you know, it, it's a, this is, so climate change is what, what um, some social scientists call a wicked problem, right? And a, a wicked problem is one that has many different solutions, but solutions for some people are um, not solutions for others. And there's no real, like a, a wicked problem is caused by all sorts of things. It's not just one thing that we can point to. Um, and so climate change is this classic example of a wicked problem. And there's all these different levers to pull to, to make, to, to um, sort of complete those jobs, right? Job number one about reducing emissions, job number two about supporting earth and so forth. Um, now, how do we actually make our, our leaders do this? I think part of it comes from um, talking more about it, right? And the more, that, the more that we're talking about climate change and normalizing conversation about climate change and what to do about it, people listen, right? Our, our leaders listen. Um, you know, right now there just isn't, like in Wisconsin, we don't have great legislation right now dealing with climate change and dealing with regulations about putting up solar. Um, you know, there's a lot of roadblocks there right now. Um, so I, I think the more that the more that the general population talks about this and normalizes this conversation around climate change, the more that those in charge of the regulations and writing those have to listen, um, and, and they start they start doing things that you know that that are being talked about. Um, so that's. I mean, I guess that, that's sort of where, where I would take it. A comment on your, one of your earlier uh, answers, and they sing, they cannot wait to support lacrosse community on joyful climate work. Thank you. Ah, well wonderful, wonderful. Well, hey, I, I, I'm right there with you. I'm, I'm trying to start a movement, right? If we can get joyful climate work going, I think that's, that, that would be, like I said, renewing, right? That was from the Integral Ecology Director. Ah, right. And a question here from Sue, I think it's the last one that I have. Um, any suggestions for approaches to, to address climate change deniers? Mm, um, yeah. Uh, so again, it's, it's um, I think we have to think a little bit about where that denial is coming from, right? And, and in many cases that denial is coming from a, a, a place of fear and uncertainty. Um, so because admitting climate change is real and that it's caused by people, we're also by default admitting that we've made some mistakes, right? And that we're doing some things wrong and that we have to actually change to make things better. Um, we have to change our ways. And for lots of people, that's really scary, right? It's not so much that they're, I, I found that it's not so much that they're denying that climate change. I mean, they are, but what they're really denying and what they're really scared of is what does this look like? Like, what do we, how, so how do we change in a way that's not going to be super uncomfortable to me? Um, and so part of it, again, is reframing that, right? And saying, well, let's, let's think about climate change and the solutions as abundance rather than scarcity, right? And what do we actually get from doing some of these, these sustainable initiatives? What, how does that feed all of us and, and, and help all of us thrive? Um, and the other thing goes back to stories, right? Like I mentioned earlier, um, it's about, um, it's about listening to people's stories and meeting them where they're at. Um, and again, denier, you know, the pe people that are deniers also have places that they love, 
right? And so let's connect with those places and let's connect with that person on an, on an individual basis and see, let's talk about those places they love. And let's talk about what they've noticed changing, right? And it, you don't even have to bring up the word, the, the phrase climate change. Let's just talk about change. Let's just, let's talk about differences. I, you know, I mean, it's, I, I think that's okay to do that. And and it's a slow conversation, right? You, you, the last thing you want to do is, is beat somebody over the head about climate change. Um, let's instead have, have actual one-on-one -on -one humane conversations and, and see if we can change things that way. Okay, great. We've got one more comment and then we have to wrap it up. Sure. Um, from Pat, excellent presentation. I would endorse joyful climate work. <laughs> Good. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear I'm not, on the, I'm not going off on some wacky path here. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, Dr. Casey, this concludes community conversations for today and community conversations is also done for the 2020-2021 season. We will return in the fall. Again, if you have topics or speakers you'd like to hear, contact us at English Lutheran or Pastor Park Hunter at Unalaska UMC. The Interfaith Coalition will meet in June to set the schedule for 2021-2022. Thanks for coming to Community Conversations. Hopefully next year we'll be able to be more in person. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.